Hi everyone. So I'm I'm very lucky to be uh, joined here by some of the some of the smartest people in in the crypto and the blockchain ecosystem. Some of the folks that are actually getting uh, something built and knocking up against the real world problems of taking our uh, collective industry and ecosystem into the next stage of its evolution by providing uh, entirely new capabilities such as derivatives, lending, insurance, kind of really building uh, the first iterations of what is in my opinion, going to be the next generation of smart contracts that will go on to define our, our, our industry. So I'm really excited to have them have them here with us. And I'm just going to ask each of them in turn to to describe what uh, what they work on, what what they're what, what they've undertaken to make in terms of smart contracts. And, and then we'll go on to some interesting questions that I know uh, I know a lot of people will find uh, find quite interesting and insight and in, in, in informative. So I guess starting starting in the in the order that we have folks here, if we can just kind of start with Kane, um, Kane, if you could tell us a little bit about what uh, what you're working on. Yeah, so uh, I'm the founder of Synthetics. Uh, Synthetics is a synthetic issuance uh, platform. So we we basically allow people to have uh, exposure to synthetic assets on Ethereum. Um, so we've got a number of synthetic assets that are available already today, uh, commodities like gold and silver, um, equity uh, indices like uh, FTSE. Um, we've got a number of crypto assets and, uh, you know, we essentially use uh, Chainlink, the Chainlink oracles to provide those price feeds to allow people to uh, get access to the price exposure to those synthetic assets. Great. Thank you. Um, Alex, if, if you don't mind telling me about some of the great, uh, telling us some of the great work you're doing. Sure, so I'm with Celsius Network, and we invented this category of interest income. I know some people call it lending, but 90% of our 100,000 users are coming to us because we pay them interest every week. So we support 13 blockchains, 27 assets in total. So the rest of them are either tokens or other type of uh, products. And um, we've been paying interest now for over two years. And so if you look at the kind of like what we call the value stack, uh, Bitcoin, the granddaddy is, is the store value king. And uh, Tether uh, is the basically form of payment. It's 80% of the traffic on, on Ethereum uh, these days. And uh, we think the third product that, that everybody needs and uh, that is a utility that 7 billion of people on the planet need is interest income because it's something that is disappearing from this planet. And uh, the other 10% of our users basically also take loans against their assets. So if you have Bitcoin or Ethereum and you don't want to sell the coin, uh, you can get uh, a cheap loan from us and uh, basically be able to use the cash and not sell the assets. So that's basically this, the utilities that we created. And uh, we have about 600 million in assets under management, paid about $12 million in interest to date to all of our users. That's more than all the DeFi guys put together. And uh, we think that that is how we bring the next uh, 100 million people into crypto, right? They're all going to come for something like interest income. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. I mean, it's, it's, it's obviously a lot of uh, success you've had in, in, in the approach you've taken. Uh, Hugh, if you don't mind telling us about all the, all the exciting kind of next level stuff you're doing. Yeah, sure. So I'm, I'm the founder of Nexus Mutual. So we're a, a people-powered people alternative to insurance. Um, running on Ethereum, a, a DeFi platform, and um, our, our visions are to become an alternative to any, a large insurance company. Um, but we're starting within the crypto native sphere, and specifically, our first product is covering Solidity code against bugs. So, to provide a claim payout if there's a hack, um, like like the DAO hack or the parity multi sig wallet issues, or more recently, um, the BZ, BZX um, hack. So. Um, we're there to provide a risk management tool for the kind of a new economy that's that we think is being built on Ethereum, and we think risk management and insurance is kind of a key part of that, as it is with any economy that that gets built. Great, great, thank you. Yeah, I th I think it's 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 very exciting, and I think insurance has a has a lot of trust issues and programmatic insurance that that looks for actual outcomes in in something proven, as it can be proven in your case, is is really the next generation of of that whole industry. Likewise, with what Kane is doing, I mean, derivatives are the world's biggest market, arguably, and uh, putting them on chain and making them work properly in that environment is 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 just probably one of the biggest opportunities out there. And in in Alex's case, I'm I'm always massively impressed by the by the returns people get on his platform. So now they can have 
uh, a large amount of cryptocurrency, which gives them all kinds of guarantees about uh, ownership. And they can also get a return that's superior to the vast majority of banks and even professional asset managers, which I, I feel like these, you guys really exemplify for me that people, uh, people that are kind of uh, pioneering, pioneering the, the next generation of, of what this technology can do. And so I'm, I'm really excited to ask you some more questions about how you're, how you're approaching that. So uh, uh, Alex, if, if, you don't, if you don't mind, I, th I think there's some interesting new ideas that are, are around Celsius, around how you're, you're planning to decentralize the project and how you're planning to approach the, the further decentralization of it, which I know we've discussed. And I, I think that's a fascinating question, which I'd, I'd be thrilled to hear some, you know, hear your point of view of how, of how you're approaching that. Sure, so, um, you know, decentralization is, uh... First, a lot of people don't even know what that is. So, uh, so, so go, go to Wikipedia and, and read about it. But for, for basically, it's not a zero to one, right? It's not like a one step. It's a process. And, and we think that uh, you almost need to have a bridge between centralized solution and decentralized solution because a lot of stops along the way. Um, and, uh, you know, especially in our community, there's a lot of kind of diehards who think, no, we, we're going to go to 100% decentralized solutions overnight. And that's where the world needs to live in. But I think uh, if we find ways to provide users um, the comfort that they used to in the centralized world and then slowly move them across, is, uh, it's really the better path. And, and that's, a, that's the path that Celsius took versus like the pure DeFi guys who just uh, don't want anything to do with the old world. And, and when, you, when you have one leg in decentralization and one leg in centralization, you're in that, you're caught in that middle, right? Because you can't rely on the old data. You have to rely on the new data from the blockchain. And there's no real bridges between the blockchain and, um, and the TCP IP network, the internet, right? So part of the, the opportunity and the problem is really, okay, who, who are your oracles? Who are the sources of data uh, that you can really uh, have this machine to machine kind of communication and, and rely on them for delivery, right? I mean. Before Celsius, I ran a, an IoT company, right? Novotel Wireless with several hundred million dollars in revenues, 1,500 employees. And, and I can tell you, we had the huge problem there of oracles, right? Of, of, of basically, how do, how do IoT devices, and there's billions of them, right? Rely on this data. So, so I think uh, what, what you guys are doing in Chainlink, uh, it, it's a brilliant idea. It's just, I can't give you enough credit for not just coming up with it, whatever, seven years ago, whatever, how long ago it was, but also sticking with it and, and cause I think you were way ahead of your time, sticking with it and waiting for the industry to kind of catch up with, 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 with the whole concept that you can deliver this independent uh, source of truth and a whole industry can be built on top of that. So, so part of our move to transparency, just last sentence, is all about kind of showing to all of our users uh, that for just a sim simple example, when we price uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum so they could buy it or exchange it or anything else, that the source of data came from not just multiple Oracle, but also we acted in the best interest of our community. So it's transparency and the ability to prove that uh, we weren't like an exchange that tried to manipulate the price or take advantage of you or anything like that. So a lot of opportunities there. And again, thanks for, uh, we're really excited about our partnership with uh, Chain. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Alex. That's that's very high praise, and I I, I appreciate it. I'm, I'm 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 glad that we can help help provide this transparency and reliability to your product and to your users, and and create this uh, environment where uh, a system like yours that has so much value can can become de more decentralized at a lower cost, at a higher level of security. And I'm uh, I'm I'm thrilled to hear that you you think so highly of it. So so thank you for your um, you know words of high praise. I really appreciate it. Now, I, I think there's there's definitely a lot of merit in what you said, but I, I, I think one of the one of the people that um, have experienced already some of that themselves is Kane at Synthetics, and I know he's he's had a lot of experience with oracles, and he's experienced in, experimenting now with the combination of oracles with various other systems that that create scalability to his product at Synthetics, and they you know they're doing some really cutting cutting edge stuff there. So Kane, would you would you mind telling us you know how is Synthetics evolving? as a product that's achieved um, you know, some kind of decentralization and then it plans to maybe expand in its capabilities or, or, or the role that uh, oracles have had in that or, or the role other systems plan to have in that. So I, I'd, I'd be thrilled to hear how Synth Synthetics has really been expanding uh, in, in, in its feature set while being in this decentralized state, in this decentralized form. 
Yeah, so so I think you know just to uh, echo what Alex said, um, you know my view uh, and you know, the approach that we've taken is that you know adding decentralization to something that people want is what you need to do, right? You know if you start with something that's fully decentralized, uh, you know there's a lot of uh, kind of rigidity to that, and and it can be hard to iterate and improve. And you know when you're building a product, you don't necessarily know what people are going to want, right? And so you know the approach that we've taken was to start fairly centralized and to you know as quickly as possible decentralize the the um, protocol. Uh, but there's other things that are obviously very critical. Um, you know particularly for a derivatives trading platform, you need uh, speed, you know, there's, there's a requirement for speed. And as we all know, um, you know, that's something that there's a pretty big trade off on Ethereum L1, uh, you know, compared to a centralized platform, right? Um, it's probably okay, uh, if you're running a lending platform to, you know, to kind of forego that potentially, uh, but for, you know, a trading platform for a decentralized exchange, uh, it's, it's pretty challenging. And so, um, we're actually running a demo at the moment, uh, with the optimism team of the OVM, which is a, a layer two scaling, uh, solution. Um, we're running that demo with our own centralized Oracle right now. Uh, but obviously, you know, talking to, uh, you know, people in Chainlink about, uh, you know, getting the Chainlink oracles migrated across there. And I think it, it's been a pretty eye-opening experience for a lot of people uh, to kind of see, you know, this, there's, there's been a lot of promises about Ethereum scalability for a long time, right? And we haven't really seen kind of a, a demonstration, I guess, that uh, could, could show how much the improvement would be, right? If you could add this scalability to the platform and to see something like synthetics, which is definitely hindered by the, the latency on Ethereum, uh, you know, and, and kind of unleashing that actual, you know, scalability and, and you know, showing people in real time what it looks like uh, has been pretty exciting. So we're super excited for that. And, and obviously, you know, leaning into uh, the scalability side of things as much as possible, because until we've got, you know, very low latency, uh, you know, price updates and oracles, it's going to be challenging to, to really take on the centralized exchanges, you know, which is the ultimate goal. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can see what you're saying. I, I think we really need to achieve systems that both provide the, the feature parity and maintain the security of, of the smart contract and the blockchain and like all these guarantees that people come to our space for. So I think that's, that's really the challenge of how do you, how do you create a certain feature richness while also maintaining all of these properties of security and the tamper proofness. And uh, yeah, it's, it's very exciting, the stuff that you're working on. And I, I think we have, we have concrete plans to make sure that oracles are available in whatever environment you, 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 you or other folks wanna, wanna consume them in. And I, I think it's, um, it's exciting that people are working on creating uh, uh, a number of solutions that allow people to basically incrementally decentralize and, and achieve the, the, the speed and the, the reliability capabilities that they want at the same time. So I, th I think all of that is, is, is quite exciting. Now, I, I, I think while, while people do that, there's all kinds of risks that they take on. And so I, I'd be thrilled to hear from, from, from Hugh at, at Nexus Mutual about how he's uh, seeing insurance, uh, insurance playing a role in the growth of DeFi and, and how he's approaching having, uh, having that, per, per, you know, what, what, what role do, do you see that performing in, in, in this exciting uh, fast evolving context. Yeah, no, thanks. I think um, there's a whole lot of, um, one thing I've noticed is that I believe there's a whole chunk of money sitting on the sidelines that wants to get involved in DeFi, but is actually worried about the technical risk of or various things or various risks of doing so. Um, and it's perhaps more regular money, less kind of the crypto gambling mentality that a lot of we've got right going around right now, which is great to get us all started. Um, but if we're to kind of get to more mainstream stuff, we need to kind of manage the risks a bit better. Um, and so hopefully we kind of can play a part um, in that and, and help out. Um, at the moment, we cover the, the bugs in the Solidity code, um, but there are a bunch of other risks out there. Um, I guess the, the recent MakerDAO um, events on, um, I guess, Black Thursday when the, when the prices dropped dramatically, um, it's kind of highlight some of those, some of those things. Um, the, at that point, the transaction fees on Ethereum went sky high, so scalability and to like read the really bad side what what, what could happen um, and and Oracle were delayed in actually getting the results on chain which um, which was which ended up with a whole bunch of things happening and you know and people people lost some money um, our Our product at the time doesn 't cover that stuff it 's just focused on solidity code and um, that 's not where we want to be. We want to have a much wider coverage mm -hmm. um, because anytime you kind of um, 
have something outside the system, there's additional risks involved. And Oracle is one of those things. Um, obviously, the, the Oracle providers could fail or be malicious or anything like that. Um, and um, Chainlink's design is kind of really good at minimizing that type of stuff. Um, but also, the, the MakerDAO ones highlighted that even if the Oracles are doing exactly what they have been designed to do, if the transaction fees spike, then they can't get the transaction through and then people can't read the data on chain. So, you know, there are other risks that people don't, um, don't necessarily think about. And um, I guess just to be to get us to be more resilient and to get us to um, comfort levels that more regular people um, would expect, um, we, we need these kind of systems in place and yeah, insurance is one part of that. Yeah, yeah, that's very exciting. And I, I think that's something that, that there'd be a lot of interest in, in terms of even related to Chainlink and providing certain guarantees to users around the reliability of those oracles in, in various manners, whether it's staking by the oracles, the security guarantees of the infrastructure they run, their performance history, or, or in this case, insurance. So I, I, think, I think it's really next generation stuff that, that you're working on, Hugh, is you're really making a, a form of cyber insurance that is um, like three steps ahead of the current forms of cyber insurance because you're, you're making it for an environment that can, can provide a lot of proof about what happened. And I, I think making insurance in, in that type of environment with a lot of proof is, is a very, very smart and useful and efficient thing to do, which I, I think can provide the types of guarantees that, that you mentioned. So I, 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 you know, my kind of really, really impressed, my kind of my hats off to you is really impressed that that uh, somebody's doing this in, in, a, in a thoughtful way, as, as thoughtful a way as you are. Now, I, I, I think some of, the, some of the other questions, and we've kind of touched on them briefly in, in, in this conversation so far, but you know, in line with the title of how oracles are gonna relate to the, to the growth of DeFi, it, it might just also be useful to get uh, everybody's measured opinion on how they think oracles will, will fit into the growth of DeFi and how, they see, uh, how they've seen that either impact their, op, their plans to grow in DeFi or, or how how it's, uh, it's gonna impact the growth of DeFi in general, like their availability or something like that. So I, I guess we can once again, start with Alex and, and just get his feedback on how, how he sees the Oracle mechanism playing, playing a role in, in whether DeFi will grow faster versus, versus slower. Yeah, so, you know, like I, I, I'm old enough to have been there at the birth of the internet and was involved with voice IP. And, you know, when, when you kind of showed that capability that's what we're using right now right and showed that to people they were like wow this is amazing and the conversion was like a hundred percent right it was like a no-brainer right but when you try to get people to switch their money from the traditional world into the DeFi world the bar is extremely high right and and you have to do a lot of convincing uh to really not just on the technical side like we talked about before that everything's going to work but also that you know what you're doing right because there's not enough players and not enough time has passed to show people that uh, uh, you know that you or others in the DeFi community know what they're doing, and and so what we're seeing is we're we're seeing a lot of early adopters kind of jumping in. They're all excited about this, and but we ran out of early adopters. And the question is, okay, where is that army of hundreds of millions of people coming in with all the money that is sitting in fiat? And to get there, you really need to solve the trust uh, issue, and you can solve it two ways. One is you can spend 700 years like the banks did of building beautiful towers with, you know, like uh, marble columns and things like that, or you can be fully transparent and be, uh, uh, deliver something that no one has done before, like acting in the user's best interest, right? Uh, and, and to do these things, transparency and specifically proving to people, even if they're not technical, proving to them that every step of your process, every step of your execution is acting in their best interest. And it all starts with data. And we're, we live in a world where some of the most successful companies in the world, you know, these guys that told us, uh, do no evil. Remember Google? That was their phrase when they started. Or Facebook. I mean, the, the people who brought you fake friends and, 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 and fake uh, uh, news are not bringing you a fake blockchain, right? So you, you just have, you can't rely on any of these people. They all just thinking about how do we extend the life of centralization? They're not thinking DeFi. They're not thinking decentralization. So... Again, oracles are a, an extremely important piece of that puzzle, of that chain. And, and we have to deliver on all those pieces just to win the trust. And if you deliver on all the pieces, maybe you're going to get 10% adoption, right? So, so it's a very difficult uh, task. It's not a simple task. And it's going to take us a while uh, to get there. 
Yeah, yeah, I think I think it's definitely something that's that's going to take uh, a lot of effort and 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 smart people to put together systems that that allow uh, consumers to really see a guarantee that they don't see in other places. I agree that it's competing against these brands, and I, I think that's a very high high bar to meet. Uh, and either something happens to those brands where those brands start to fail in their guarantees, and that accelerates it. Or the, like in your case, the returns plus the, the ability to prove extreme reliability starts to make it a no brainer. So the, the risk hits, hits near zero limits, but the returns are substantially higher and therefore people switch over. But, but that, that, that proof does need to come into existence uh, to overcome the, the, the skyscrapers, right? The, the, big, the big brand that basically says, trust me, I have a skyscraper. And yeah, I, th I think that's a very, very thoughtful, uh, accurate picture of things. Um, so on, on this same point, I guess, uh, Kane, you, you've been working with oracles now for, um, you know, for, for, for many, many years, actually, you've, you've dog fooded a lot of the things related to oracles in ways that people, other people haven't. Uh, and I'm sure, you know, you have points of view on how have there being more oracles or less oracles or better oracles or worse oracles or, or how any of those dynamics would, would, in your opinion, impact either the growth of specifically the type of DeFi you're working on or, or, uh, maybe through new markets or something, or, 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 or the growth of DeFi in general? Yeah, so, so I think, you know, one thing that people uh, maybe was really obvious, uh, you know, a while ago, and, and I think a lot of the, you know, enthusiasts and early adopters that are in the ecosystem have kind of forgotten is that blockchains are disconnected from the rest of the world, right? They're a self-contained system. They, they don't, care or know about anything outside of themselves right they're they're like a, a two-year-old right they they just know about themselves and that's it right and if you want to take all of this activity that's happening outside of blockchain and bring it in you need to be able to tell the blockchain about what's happening right you, you or you don't or you can try and recreate that activity from scratch in there and hope that people will just make this huge leap across this chasm into this uh, system but you know, the reality is that people need you know, some handholding, they need assurances, they need to have confidence in it. And I think that when you can take uh, information from the real world and put it into this self-contained system uh, to kind of connect it back, uh, it can provide people some confidence, right? You can give them information uh, that they're used to having, you know, in these external systems and, and bring them into the blockchain context and, and let them uh, use that to, you know, provide new services or provide, um, you know, uh, functionality that, that they don't have in a more transparent way. And so I think that, you know, for us, uh, you know, as you said, we, we've kind of been dealing with oracles for a long time. Uh, you know, we want to have that system be as robust as it possibly can be. Right. And so we don't want a system, uh, that is specific to our needs. We want a system that's generalized, that's, you know, scalable and extensible. And we want to be able to consume that service, uh, rather than try to recreate it ourselves. Um, and so I think, you know, there's, there's kind of this, uh, this fundamental question of, do you take the real world information, do you bring it in, or do you try and recreate it, you know, inside this little closed ecosystem? And, and obviously my view is, you know, in the short term, until we can really build up what's over here in this blockchain context, we need to bring in the external information. And so, you know, that's what Chainlink does for us. And that's what's allowed us to kind of scale up to having so many different assets, um, you know, things like equities and commodities, and, and obviously, you know, newer assets like, uh, Brent crude, for example, that we're working on, um, you know, bringing all of that across to this, uh, this new ecosystem and letting people interact with it is, is kind of the goal. Yeah, I, th I think you, you made one, one point that really also resonates with me and many other people we talk to is that there's, there's a certain level of complexity with building a decentralized infrastructure. And a lot of these teams are really, I wouldn't say limited, but every, every company, every technology company, even at medium to large sizes, is, is constrained in its technical resources, right? And I, I think the way that I have always seen people successfully build high quality applications in the web world has been they focus on building an application and then they use infrastructure that other people built. They, they don't necessarily devote their limited technical resources to building infrastructure. Because if you do that, what I've often seen is people end up in many cases, you know, if they don't graduate to, to some kind of infrastructure provider, in this in many cases, it's Ethereum. In many cases, it's some, some blockchain that provides one layer, one of infrastructure, and then another layer of infrastructure is, is oracles. But the, the attempt to both make an application and rebuild one, two, three, however many pieces of infrastructure is, is something that I've recurrently seen slow people down to the point where it's very difficult for them to be competitive. And often they realize it, uh, realize it late. So I'm, 
I'm, I'm really thrilled to hear that, uh, you know, we, you've been able to launch new markets and, and that's, that's something that uh, I, I think that's really the, the, the good marriage between good infrastructure and good teams that make high quality applications is those teams can now make as many great applications and as many features as they want because they have the right inputs, outputs, infrastructure to do that. So I'm, I'm, I'm really thrilled to, to hear that, Kane. The, the other quick question is, is also how does, um, you know, how do oracles affect decentralized insurance? How do they enable, enable that? How do they interact with, with, with that category of DeFi? And, you know, like I said, Hugh is, is one of the few people actually making a very, very tangible progress in, in making decentralized insurance a reality. Hugh, I'm, I'm sure we'd all be thrilled to hear how you see oracles uh, either growing DeFi or, or applying directly to the growth of decentralized insurance. It's, uh, I think it's a very exciting topic. Yeah, I guess, I guess two, two main points, like kind of echoing Kane that like basically the blockchain world is kind of separated and like to build anything interesting, you generally have to take in some outside information. Um, there are some things that don't and you can do it with like economic incentive games and bringing stuff in um, manually and all the rest of it. Um, like I guess Unisops is a reasonably good example there. Um, but um, I think if you don't rely on oracles, then it's going to take us a lot longer to get there um, and bringing everything on um, kind of natively, if you want to describe it that way, um, is going to be a long, hard research road without many users for a very long time. Um, and some of those problems may not even be solvable. Um, I mean, an example there is like, you could um, use Uniswap as a price oracle, but it's not robust enough to do much with it because we've seen that it's been attacked multiple times or manipulated to attack other systems. Um, so it, it makes sense, it completely makes sense to choose a much more robust solution right now. Maybe um, a native blockchain solution can work in the future for price feeds, I don't know. Um, theoretically, I guess it could, but um, we, we might be a long way from that. Um, in, terms of, in terms of insurance, like to do anything with insurance, you need some sort of information outside the chain to tell you what happened. Um, is there a claim payable or not? Um, and so you need some way to bring it on. Um, and you can do that via oracles or voting mechanics or various things, but um, the oracles are gonna be a key part of that um, and with a whole bunch of different solutions. But if, if we're only looking at self-referential stuff on the blockchain, we're not gonna get very far very quickly. So we, yeah, we, we need oracles and um, outside information sources on, on chain um, to you know, use the benefits that we have got um, in terms of DeFi, of like automatic, automatically um, programming things in a trustless way so people could be confident that they, they know what's gonna happen um, with their funds. So you know, um, yeah, it's a key part of um, how we're building. And I see it as a, as, very critical to actually speeding up adoption and getting um, and getting users on with meaningful products. Yeah, yeah, I completely uh, completely agree with you, Hugh. I, th I think those are very uh, astute points, and I um, I particularly think that at this point there is some amount of you know price data generated in some kind of on chain environment, but it doesn't actually represent the real universe of what actual price is. And I, I think the the reality is if you have any kind of oracle mechanism that doesn't provide market coverage, that doesn't properly cover all the places where price is represented and doesn't cover all the places where price discovery could happen and where volume could shift, then, then you have a significant problem and, and actually a huge architectural risk. So I, I think at some point years from now, far into the future, there, 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 there could be enough data generated on various chains and that data could be shuttled between chains in, in some meaningful way. But uh, right now, still, and for you know years, year, year, years longer, I, I think the majority of data that people are are going to want to actually rely on, that's going to represent the reality of a price or a claim, or 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 some kind of actual event, is is going to be delivered from these off-chain systems. And the the problem is, it's a chicken and egg problem. If you if you try to build products only within a blockchain data context, you you don't build very much. People say, oh, you can't build very much in that context. Nobody else tries, and you're and you're stuck in a land of tokens, which is which is a limited place for for this technology to continue living. Whereas if you build um, build using external systems, then you know the entire world of digital contracts is available to you to 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 properly create derivatives like, like Kane is doing, or or all, all kinds of uh, things with with interest payments or even next generation insurance products. And and so I'm 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 really really thrilled and, and gratified that to hear that. The, the work uh, on oracles and, and the, the role that you guys see it playing is important. Um, I, I think these have been some, some really thoughtful points that, that you've made. 
uh, unfortunately, we don't have longer for this panel. I feel like we could be we could keep talking about this for another hour or two, and, and not, none of us would be tired from discussing it. I, I know I'd I'd be I'd be thrilled to talk again about this more, and I'm sure once we're out of the out of the bubble we all live in now, we can we can meet up and discuss it more. But I I really appreciate all the thoughtful insights you've had, and and um, thank you thank you very much for joining us, and it's it's been a great conversation. Thank you.